Hello, comrades. My name is Leah. My pronouns are she, her. I'm the co-chair of Austin DSA, along with Ana Perez, who is our DJ today. Um, I'm going to give a chair's report. Here's the link to the agenda in the chat. Um, and then we'll get started with some campaign updates and then the real meat of the event are the endorsements and debate. So hello, dear comrades. Um, it's been about two years that we've been in a global pandemic and um, you know, we're now worried about Omicron, which we know is a variant that came from abroad that likely comes from folks who are unvaccinated. And we know that here in America, the taxpayers paid for our um, vaccines to be developed and we could easily share the recipe with the world, but we choose not to because there's some very powerful and rich people who don't want that. Um, we had a week of crazy climate. We, it was 80 degrees here in mid-December and um, there were tornadoes around. And the promises of Build Back Better are looking bleaker and bleaker. And I've been thinking a lot about Democrats versus Republicans in power, right? And we go back and forth constantly. Democrats are in power and then Republicans are in power. And when Democrats are in power, we might avoid a catastrophe like the Iraq war, although Democrats still support that sometimes. And when Republicans are in power, they win. They win a lot. They win Supreme Court seats. They win their legislation. They support what their base wants. And they fight for that. They fight tooth and nail for that. And Democrats, we get a lot of excuses. Um, we get excuses that the Senate parliamentarian says that the rules won't let us do the things that we want. It's just against the rules. And we hear that there's this, you know, one guy, if it weren't for this one Joe Manchin guy, this coal baron who lives on a yacht, then, you know, we'd give you everything. We'd give you the PRO Act, we'd expand Medicare, we'd do all this stuff, but it's just, you know, it's the one guy, we can't do it, he won't let us, it's up to him. It's how it works, those are the rules. And I don't buy it. I increasingly just don't buy this line. I've, I think that's like a, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is I've seen what Democrats can do in when they really wanna win. I've seen the way that they bring every important person and the you know grandfather, President Obama, and they bring, they break all the rules and, and they do everything to, you know, when it looks like Bernie might win a primary. <laughs> You know, we've seen it. We've seen what they can accomplish when they want to. And we also know that they there are things that Biden could do with a swish of a pen. He could forgive student loans. Um, he could even postpone payments on student loans, but he doesn't do it. And now we hear his press secretary say, you know, we're just looking, we just, we need a bill to sign. We need legislation. We, we just can't do it. And we know that's not true. Um, and... You know, we know that Biden could do a little bit more than just inviting Manchin to the White House for tea to fight for the things that he wants to fight for. He could leave the White House. He could campaign and fight for that. And, you know, it's not magic. It's not a secret. We know how to win. When you unite working class people together behind a common demand, there are far more of us than there are of them, and we win. You know, we see... Kellogg's Megacorp, right? Like um, they were refusing to negotiate. They were about to permanently replace and fire their striking workers. Um, and we saw Bernie reach out and fundraise and say, we need to support the labor movement. And then we see him start planning this huge rally and we see these great posters online. And all of a sudden, poof, Kellogg's back at the table. We've got a tentative agreement. We start winning. You know, we see Starbucks workers, just 20 people in a Starbucks shop in Buffalo fighting the megacorp of megacorps with locations all around the world doing everything they can to bust this union. And they won. Working people win when we come together. It is not a secret and it is not magic. We know how to win. So 
what is Austin DSA doing um, to fight and win working class power? One of the ways that we're very focused on today is endorsements. We work on campaigns. Um, we work really hard on campaigns. And you know, we often say we're not a club, we're not a democratic club, we're socialists, we're a movement. We don't just do paper endorsements. We don't endorse the Democrat is most likely to win or the Democrat in every race. We are fighting for socialism and we're a movement. And we choose the candidates that's gonna, that's gonna advance that movement and fight for us. And we often tell people, you know, when you're thinking about an endorsement, I want you to think, are you willing to give this person your nights and your weekends and your blood, sweat and tears? You know, are you gonna fight for them when you vote for them? And, you know, a lot of times we talk about that because we want people to think, you know, not just, is this good or bad? Do I want it? Yes or no? We want you to think, am I gonna fight for this? Like, and because we want our endorsements to matter. We want them to mean something and we want people to be open socialists to, in order to fight for our endorsements or members of TSA. And we, um, you know, I think about that a lot, but I think maybe that's, I want us to be a little bit more strategic. It, you know, I don't want it to just be a feeling. Do I feel inspired enough? Do I like this person enough? I want us to start thinking about, does this grow Austin DSA? Does this build us up? Does this let us, should we prioritize campaigns that let us talk about socialism and talk about class struggle issues and build working class power and talk about how we build working class power in Austin? And we choose campaigns where we work closely together and we, we build up our organizers where we're more than the sum of our parts. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about building up our organizers too, because it's been a year since the Austin DSA convention. It's been a year since I was elected and your leadership committee was elected. And at that convention, we also passed new bylaws that moved the date of the next convention to March or April or April or May, excuse me. So we've got about four or five months left in our term. And I've been thinking about our previous leadership committee and how they constantly talked about this bullseye concept. They were constantly saying, you know, there's this, this, this idea that there's a lot of different people in Austin DSA. We've got new people. Awesome. They just joined us and they're on the outside of the bullseye. And we've got volunteers. We've got our regular committed volunteers who, you know, when we tell them we need you to come, we need you to knock on doors and make phone calls. They, they show up and they do that. And then we've got folks who organize those events, those, those door knocking canvases. Thank you, Anna. And then in the middle, we've got people who've organized a few events and now they're training people how to organize, you know? Um, and we're constantly trying to pull people into the center of that bullseye. And our previous leadership committee talked about this so much. I literally told them like, please stop. I can't hear you explain this concept one more time. I'm so sick of it. And I was wrong and they were right. And we should have been talking about this all year. And we should have been focused on this all year and training people up and training our replacements and answering that question. How do I do a thing at Austin DSA all the time? And um, so my ask today here for you is to ask yourself when you're voting, when you're thinking about what you're going to do in the future with Austin DSA, how does this grow Austin DSA and how does this inspire me to get involved? How, how is this something that's going to grow our organizer base? And how am I, you know, we're also going to be reaching out to you and bugging you about this, but it, it's always great to reach out first. And, you know, there's ways you can get involved. There's some exciting stuff we're going to talk about today, some events you can show up to. There's on Slack, every committee and every campaign has a channel on Slack, or they will very soon. Show, join one, you know, if you're interested, if one piques your interest, join and, and just, you can post in there and say, hey, I'm interested in getting more involved. Everyone who runs that channel and the people, the chairs of that channel, of that committee or campaign, we love to see that. Um, and I want you to also think about who do you respect in this organization and 
reach out to them and tell them to run. I never in a million years would have run for co-chair if someone hadn't told me to do it. And now is the time where you can get involved and you can really build up your skills and build up your credibility in the chapter if you're interested in running for leadership. Um, so please tell people to do that. Um, and I also want you to think back to when we, if you worked on a previous campaign with Austin DSA, or maybe even if you just saw that video or look it up of when Starbucks members, when they first found out that they won their union, that like pure joy and love for each other, that's solidarity. And there is nothing stronger than solidarity in this whole world. And we are gonna build it and we are gonna win some stuff. So if, we were in a crowd, I would say, who's with me? <laughs> but here we are. Yeah, I love y'all. So, okay, let's get this started. So our next speaker is Anna and Clarissa um, to talk a little bit about some upcoming training. Um, yeah, I can kick us off. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us on Zoom. My name is Anna. I use she, her pronouns. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, if you're newer or, you know, you're hearing about all these campaigns, but you're like, ah, I've never really done this before. I don't know if I'm the right person to show up to an event. Uh, then this is the training for you. Um, we're going to be doing virtual electoral organizing trainings um, starting January 11th. Uh, they'll be um, once a week. And I'm going to go ahead and let Clarissa talk to y'all about the content. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Clarissa. I use they, them pronouns. Um, I'm the organizing director with Austin awesome Safer One, also a DSA member. Uh, very happy to be here with y'all. Um, so during Prop A, we kind of um, had like moments where we realized like we could we have all these solid trainings and all these you know procedures and ways to teach people how to do stuff and we kind of realized that we could just take all of that and make it as accessible as possible so we uh put Austin a safer one in DSA together which is my favorite place to be if you're asking me um and we came up with like I think it's a five-week course with um we go over canvassing, phone bank, and voter contact strategies, because um, it can be a little overwhelming, right? If you've never gone out canvassing or just called people on the phone talking about a candidate or an issue, um, you can kind of feel overwhelmed. And we want to do these trainings in order to make it like easier just generally. Um, and it goes kind of past that to also learn how to host canvases and host phone banks and write your own scripts um, because as y'all probably know, um, DSA works because it relies on everyone, you know, everyone is a part of this. Um, so this is our attempt to give everyone the tools. So if we need, you know, a script, all of a sudden folks, like more than two people will know how to write a script or cut turf or host a canvas. Um, so we go over relational organizing, deep canvassing, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm really excited. I am kind of always saying, um, but it's just because I don't know how to communicate how freaking stoked I am um, because I feel like I've just constantly been rolling on campaigns like, oh, I know how to do this, know how to do this. Um, but now it's time for everyone to know. And that's how we really, you know, make meaningful changes if we're all involved on campaigns. Um, makes it more fun and easy. Uh, there'll be five of them starting on January 11th, like Anna said. Uh, we'll do several modules, and then the last one will be kind of a social where we talk about self-care and burnout because, again, as all of y'all know, that is a real thing when it comes to organizing. And I believe, Anna, do you have the sign-up link? Yeah, so Anna will drop this uh, Google form that we have. Uh, can show your interest, and then we will bug the hell out of you. Uh, probably the week before the training uh, to give you all the Zoom stuff. And yeah, did I miss anything, Anna? I don't think so. I'll say um, that was great. 
also for the time um we were thinking tuesday evenings but it hasn't been set in stone yet so 7 p.m works better for people um probably better to start a little bit early because this is going to be an interactive training um, it's not going to be just us lecturing to you there's going to be role playing and activities so that you know you're not just sitting in front of your computer screen uh like watching a show or something um yeah so it'll probably be like uh up to two hours an hour and a half to two hours so it's likely around 6 30 or 7 start time on tuesdays awesome thanks y'all all right next up we've got two exciting updates from one of our endorsed um winning campaigns jose garza um, district attorney first we have a general update from trudy and then we have a specific update from stephanie on what they're doing to prosecute wage theft. So Trudy, are you ready? Yep. Hi, everybody. I am Trudy. Um, I wanted to start by saying Jose is sorry he couldn't be here, but he's traveling today. Um, just wanted to give you all a really brief update on what we've been doing since the election. Um, first, we've quadrupled, I think, the number of DSA members in our office. <laughs> um, I see Dominic Salvera here and Stephanie, who's going to be talking in a second. Um, when Jose first started, we sat down and talked to a, a career long prosecutor and Jose asked the prosecutor, you know, what do victims bring to this process to you? What, why is it important to be here? And the prosecutor said, they bring frustration to me. Um, and we unpacked it and the prosecutor said, you know, oftentimes it's, they're not cooperative, they've got issues and it's hard for me to get a conviction. That prosecutor is no longer with the office. <laughs> and I think it is so representative of the deep cultural change that we've been going through in the office to really recognize why we're here, recognize that mass incarceration and any path to a conviction is just as harmful um, to the community for victims and people who are accused of crimes. So we've really worked hard a lot this year on centering the voices of victims um, and not focusing on the conviction, not focusing on how, how long can we get this prison sentence? What do we need the victim to say so we can get this conviction? But instead to think about how can we make sure that this doesn't happen again to somebody else? And how can we try to repair the harm that was done to this person? Um, our second goal was to prioritize community safety. So everything we do is centered around community safety and data and evidence-based research that shows how to prevent future crimes from happening. I think as y'all are aware, we have had a rising number of homicides. And while the right would like you to believe it's because Jose is in office <laughs> um, or because there was a movement to defund the police, we know that that's not true. We know that the pandemic has caused irreparable trauma to our country, to Travis County, and to the people that live here. Um, we also know that the best way to prevent future violence is not necessarily by locking people up and throwing away the key, but by preventing it from happening in the first place. So this fall, we released a four-part plan that focused on how to prevent gun violence. Um, a lot of it is working with the Office of Violence Prevention, which I know DSA was a big part of getting it started, um, and violence interrupters, working outside of the law enforcement um, paradigm to really think about how do we prevent crime in the community, um, working to get a trauma recovery center, again, a center outside of law enforcement that will work with victims of violent crime and get them the services that they need. Um, also making sure for family violence to get guns out of the hands of people that might cause further harm. We also know that just a felony conviction in and of itself down the road causes more harm than anything else. I think as you all know, it can prevent housing chances, job chances, life chances, <laughs> chances to go to the, your kid's school and watch a play. Um, before Jose was in office, about 500 people who were facing their first felony arrest um, were eligible for diversion and got diversion. So they were able to do services to avoid that felony conviction. We greatly expanded that to include people who have a prior conviction. Um, we've reviewed almost 6,000 cases to determine where, whether or not they're eligible. 
And so far we've accepted close to 4,500. So that's 4,500 people who are not gonna have a felony conviction or another felony conviction um, and who we're getting out of the system as soon as we possibly can. We also are doing an expungement expo where we'll be expunging the records of about 300 people this year. We have another one planned for the fall. Um, <clears throat> we're committed to treating substance abuse disorders like public health issues. We don't prosecute less than a gram of narcotics um, unless there's a serious public safety reason for it. We also partnered with local advocates um, and groups, including DSA, to raise awareness about the growing overdose and public health crisis. And we're helping to sponsor overdose prevention trainings that will be held in early 2022. We spent a lot of time talking to stakeholders in the criminal justice system about why um, services within the criminal justice system are just not as effective as services outside of the criminal justice system. We also can't say this enough because it will save lives. If somebody is overdosing and a friend calls 911, we will not prosecute the 911 caller. Um, it is incredibly important that the fear of an arrest doesn't prevent someone from getting a loved one help. Um, we're also looking back. We're looking back and seeing how we can repair the trauma of the past. We agree to the release of Rosa Jimenez, who was convicted of murder and sentenced to life. We now believe that no crime was ever committed, that a child's death was simply accidental. We have a conviction integrity unit that's overseeing the review of thousands and thousands of cases. Um, just last week, we got relief on a drug possession case where the person had been convicted um, uh, in part because of DNA found on some drugs. Um, and we agreed to relief and the criminal court of appeals just granted it. Um, we are committed to prosecuting powerful actors who abuse the system and police officers who break the law. Um, Jose promised y'all that we are going to bring every case involving a police officer's use of deadly force to the grand jury. We have presented a total of 34 cases. Of those, the grand jury has indicted 11 officers um, on everything ranging from murder to official misconduct. Um, we've also signed an agreement uh, with the Department of Labor to prosecute appropriate wage theft cases that they have investigated. And now seems a perfect time to toss it to Stephanie, who's going to talk a lot more about wage theft and what we're doing there. Thanks so much, Judy. Um, and we wanted to leave time for questions too at the end if, if y'all wanted to learn more about anything that's been presented so far. Um, but hi, everyone. Thanks for having me here. I'm, I'm Stephanie Garcani, and I use she, her pronouns. And um, I recently uh, joined uh, the district attorney's office in September to help launch um, the economic justice initiative that Jose is starting in this office. And um, one of the goals of this initiative and part of the work that I'm doing is making sure that um, when we talk about holding powerful actors accountable, that also includes holding employers accountable. Um, historically, the state has not um, shied away from um, prosecuting workers for crimes allegedly committed against their employers, but we know that um, that has not been reciprocated the other way around. And we also know um, that workers often are victims of crime committed um, by their employers, including wage theft. So my work is really focused on, on building out this work and particularly building out our wage theft prosecution work. Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit more about that and, and really start off by just mentioning that as I'm talking about this work, this is still happening within the context of you know, Jose's broader vision of what it means to reimagine public safety. And that includes reimagining accountability um, and what accountability means in cases like this. So I wanted to say that out front. Um, so sometimes the non-payment of wages isn't uh, criminal conduct, but sometimes it really can rise to the level of criminal conduct. And uh, especially when there's instances where it's um, there's evidence that shows that the employer had an intention to avoid paying workers what they were due under the law. Um, and so that could happen in a variety of ways. That could happen by um, an employer being deceptive about um, the resources that they have to pay someone. It could happen sometimes because employers are um, diverting or withholding um, wages that are intended for an employer uh, for an employee. It could happen in, in a whole bunch of ways. Um, and these are the sorts of cases that we're looking at and looking to see um, where and how we can use tools that are available in, in the criminal legal system um, to help hold employers accountable. 
Um, so a uh, part of what I've been building out is a way for people to refer these cases to our office. I know oftentimes um, victims of wage theft don't necessarily know where to go, and they certainly don't think of um, the criminal legal system as an avenue many times. And so what we have built out is um, a form that's on uh, the, the DA's website. We also have an email address that's dedicated to this, and I'll link all of this in the chat so um, you all have it. But really, um, part of the reason why I'm here is because um, I'm just trying to help sp spread the word about this new initiative. Um, personally, because of my previous experience, I have good contacts in um, the construction industry and folks who are trying to build power in that industry. But I know that there are a lot of workers and in many other industries in our county um, that maybe aren't as organized um, or that I don't have relationships with. Um, and I know that you all are people who, who know people, who know people who can help us make sure that when um, workers experience these crimes, um, we can find out about them and investigate them. Um, so I will link all of that here. Um, what I have been also telling folks is I'd much rather someone reach out, um, even if they're not certain about like what's going on and if it's illegal or not, then then stay silent, right? And the worst thing that I can say is maybe this isn't a case that our office can handle. And if there's a referral that I can give, I will give it. If I think that this is a case that could be referred to the TWC or the Department of Labor, like those are all things that I'm really happy to do. Um, and um, even if you don't feel like you have all the information yet, or even if you're um, just reaching out because you've heard from someone else about something that might be going on and, and they're not really sure what their options are yet. I'm I'm just, I'm here for all of it. So don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and again, thank you for, for having me here today. I really appreciate it. So maybe we'll pause and if people have questions for Trudy or for myself, um, now's the time to ask yeah, them. We have, we have a couple minutes. Um, yeah, so you tell us later in general. terms of, the agenda when we need to wrap up, but. Um, and yeah, if you said, if you post those links in the Zoom, I'll also add them to the agenda so folks can find them later. Um, all right. Oh, Sarah, go ahead. Sorry, I was gonna type it, but when does it count as something that the DA can actually prosecute? Does it have to be a certain amount of money? Does there have to be evidence that they really did it on purpose and it wasn't just like a bureaucratic goof or what's like, can you give us an idea? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different statutes that we're thinking of for these cases. And so um, there's not necessarily a specific dollar amount. My, um, we've also, I should say, have been in touch with the county attorney's office as well. And so if it's not a case that constitutes a felony, we already have a communication pipeline with the county attorney's office where I can make a referral to them. So I would, um, I would just say, like, if you think something's going on, reach out to me and, um, and you know, we'll evaluate it and find that case a home, um, even if it's not something that we can take ourselves. Okay. Um, and I'm going to close that because we're running low on time, but uh, Seneca? Thank you so much. Um, yes, yeah, Stephanie, I was wondering um, if it would be possible to get uh, maybe at some point in the, the future uh, a training on, uh, especially for our um, restaurant organizing folks, uh, totally. on um, how to document this stuff, right? Like, because if I assume that, you know, our, our people who are doing the organizing are going to be encountering people who are the victims of these crimes pretty constantly. So the question is, like, how can we? you know, show workers how to best document, record the stuff happening in their workplaces um, so that when we bring it to you, it's a nice little bow and that like, we are not the reason why a boss is getting off basically. Yeah, I'd be happy to work with you on that in the new year. So let's just follow up about that. Thanks. All right, and Don? I don't really have a question. I just want to say thank you and express deep appreciation for everything that Jose is doing and how he's modeling exactly what and why it's important to get really strong justice-oriented DSA connected uh, elected officials in office and like I've never even heard of this kind like this level of like really dramatic action being done 
at the at the DA level, and he's he's a fucking trailblazer. And I'm really happy we helped get elected, and I look forward to electing more people like him. So thank you very much. Thanks, Don. We love positivity. All right. Um, thanks, y'all. Um, okay, next up, we have a campaign update from the Andrew Hairston for Justice of the Peace campaign, which we endorsed um, last, uh, or was it one before that? Anyway, take it away, Marina. Hey, what's up, y'all? I'm Marina, and I use she, her pronouns. I'm sad not to be seeing you in person, but um, I really appreciate our chapter leadership for prioritizing everybody's health and safety and being able to kind of turn on a dime like they had to this morning. Um, I am here to encourage everybody to come out to our canvas tomorrow, which is going to be happening at noon in Givens Park. Um, and I guess I just kind of wanted to speak to the urgency of doing so. First off, I, I know a lot of folks here are like zooming in from like their families' houses and stuff in other states because you've already traveled home. So like bless you for like taking time out of your precious family trips to, to, to be here. But for anybody who's not in that situation, who is able to come out and canvas tomorrow, I know the weather kind of sucks. I know that it's a little bit spooky with like Omicron variants and stuff. We are all gonna be masked up and we're asking that nobody show up unless they're vaxxed. Um, but the reason why this is important is kind of like exactly the things that we just talked about with the campaign update from, uh, you know, Jose Garza's office. Whenever we elect our own people to uh, these positions of power, and it's not just like a good, you know, like a good lib or something, it's somebody who is connected to movements that are building power in the way that we are we have the ability to really transform these systems and really change things. And in so doing, we have the ability to show other DSA chapters and other organizers all across the country a model for what this can look like, right? We're, you know, whenever we dream big, we give other people permission to do so also. This is the last canvas that can happen in the month of December. And the, these elections, you know, the canvas is officially for Andrew Hairston um, but with, you know, pending the way that these votes go today, we could also be canvassing for, uh, you know, Greg Kassar, who, you know, frankly needs no introduction, and Bob Leibel, who is a good friend of mine and a community organizer. Um, I think that, you know, the urgency of this is that March 1st is the election day, right? So that means that we're going to have two months, y'all. We're going to have two months to reach the voters that we need to reach to, you know, connect voters with these campaigns to sort of paint the picture of what can be if we get these candidates elected, you know, specifically Andrew Hirston for now pending the other two votes and everything. Um, and so I would just say, if you are here, if you don't already have a commitment tomorrow, please come out and help us, um, you know, transform the justice of the Peace Court so that it's focused on keeping people, keeping tenants in their homes, so that we're literally grinding evictions to a halt um, in at least one JP court. And then, you know, as a former educator, something that I care about a lot is JP courts also uh, preside over juvenile convictions. And so if there's a kid, like a lot of the kids that I worked with who are dealing with an enormous, unfathomable amount of trauma, and they mouth off to a teacher or they do something inappropriate, they don't wind up locked in a cage because the judge who was presiding over their case had no perspective on their life. Um, I would encourage anybody who has any questions for me, uh, please feel free to reach out. Um, but I don't wanna take up too much time. I know that we're kind of you know, trying to be efficient here and there's a lot of really important discussion to happen. So you know, please, I invite you to come out. It'll hopefully be a pretty smooth, pretty good day. Um, and I would really love to see some comrades there. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Marina. I'm excited. I'll see you tomorrow. I I also heard a rumor we might hang out a little bit after, maybe get a drink or something somewhere outside and distant. So it could be fun. Um, okay. I'm going to share the link to the agenda one last time in here. And um, so we're moving on to the um, votes. So 
for each, we have three items that we'll be voting on today. The first one will be um, whether or not to fund scholarships for the Labor Notes Conference, uh, whether or not to endorse Bob Libel for Travis County Commissioner, Precinct 2, and whether or not to endorse uh, Greg Kassar for Congress. Um, and um, for each section, we, we will um, have a motivational speech from, from someone um, to support the vote. Uh, and then we'll take questions uh, from the body and then we'll have debate for and against. Um, so um, first up, we have the Labor Notes scholarships and our motivational speaker is Joshua Fries. Thank you, Leah. Uh, I wanna start with just a bit, little bit of background of what Labor Notes is for folks who, who, don't, who don't, aren't familiar with it. In the period, come to be known as the long 70s, which was the 70s, part of the 60s, and even a little of the 80s. There was the first real upsurge in labor in decades, uh, beginning with Miners for Democracy, uh, you know, groups in auto and transit, and a lot of just rank and file activity, telephone workers and CWA teachers. Across many industries, there was this series of uprising. Unfortunately, unlike in previous such periods, there wasn't much connection between the unions, between the industries, because unlike in the past, there wasn't significant left organization in the US and what there was had little or poor connections to labor. Labor Notes was founded in significant part to address that lack. It pushed democracy and militancy in the labor movement and was sort of the little d democratic wing of the union movement. They put out a, a monthly paper, but they also saw themselves as a network, not just a publication. And every two years, they have a conference that brings together union members within and across industries. And this year's is June 17th through 19th in Chicago. There are a hundred or more workshops for all variety of subjects that folks in unions, that activists in unions, need, beating apathy. Of course, we all need that in our movements, right? Building a union stewards network, talking to coworkers about politics, health and safety at work, sectoral meetings for auto workers, you know, Railroad Workers United, uh, which is a cross union organization, was founded in part through labor notes uh, and in significant part through TDU, which is another uh, a reform group within the Teamsters Union. And these workshops are oriented not towards fixing a narrow problem, as important as those problems are, but toward using the fixing of that problem to build a movement, to build stronger unions. The people you meet at Labor Notes, this is the most important gathering of labor activists in the United States. Our members will learn more at Labor Notes than anywhere else, uh, besides on the job, of course, about building unions that are compatible with and necessary for building the socialist movement we are trying to build. The, inspire, the inspiring people there, the, the most inspiring visionary and dedicated labor activists in the country coming together in one, well, not room, because there's too many of them, but in one building. And we need our members there to learn what's to, what can be learned to participate and to meet other people in the movement. The details of the motion. This allocates money for up to 10 full scholarships, well, perhaps more if some folks only request a partial one, partial subsidy. Uh, the decision of who will be sent is given to a committee of three, two appointed by uh, the leadership committee and one by the labor branch based on the request submitted by DSA members to the committee. The costs, it's roughly $700 I figured out. And so the motion allocates up to $7,000 from DSA Austin's coffers to attend. Uh, Quinn kindly provided our treasurer uh, a couple of weeks ago some details about where we are currently financially. He says, as of December 1st, we have a little over 45,000 in the bank. We average about 2,500 in contributions per month. We have about 300 in recurring administrative expenses. We're planning on GBM space costing two to 500 and the office costing 1,000 to $1,500 per month. I would expect us to need at the absolute most 10,000 for initial deposits and expenses for the office. What this tells me is that this is not a financial strain for the branch. The training and the motivation that our members will receive here 
is vital. The connections they remember is critical. We need to send people to labor notes and this will allow folks who might not be able to do it on their own dime to go and pick up the skills and connections that we need. Thank you, Joshua. Okay, I am going to start taking uh, speakers. Uh, oh, sorry, we're doing questions first. So um, if you have a question about this uh, resolution, please uh, type stack in the chat and we take some time to answer questions. And it better be a question and not a speech because we have time for that too. Okay, looks like we don't have any questions. So we'll, we'll go straight to speeches. Um, if you would like to speak for or against, please write stack for or against so that we Thank you so much. Um, we will keep voting open until midnight tonight. Um, so we'll let you know to early tomorrow morning um, the results of all the votes. Uh, next up, we are voting on endorsing Bob Leibel for Travis County Commissioner of Precinct 2. I'm expecting Bob is giving the motivational speech to start us off. I, I didn't know it was an option that uh, you could have others do it for you, but um... Yeah, I, I certainly can. Uh, so thanks everybody for being here. Um, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity and um, I'm really excited about the possibility of a DSA endorsement. Um, it's really amazing to see so many friends and comrades and people that I have worked with in various uh, movements over the last 20 years on this call. Um, I remember those uh, bus driver union days um, from being a student activist at the University of Texas in the early 2000s. Um, so good to see you, Joshua. Um, uh, so, uh, and this is my wife, Meg, uh, who precedes me as a DSA member, actually. Um, um, so I'm running for Travis County Commissioner's Court Precinct 2. Um, a little bit about me, I'm a uh, community organizer, um, a longtime criminal justice reform and immigrant rights advocate. Um, I was the executive director at Grassroots Leadership for eight years. Um, I, I've been, uh, you know, very involved in both national advocacy around immigrant rights, fighting the private prison industry, taking on immigration and customs enforcement, both at a local and national level, um, and in local criminal justice reform efforts, um, things like uh, ending voluntary uh, compliance with immigration detainers at the jail, restoring in-person visitation, um, uh, passing the Freedom City policy along with many of the people who are in this virtual room. Um, uh, uh, and I think most recently, right, the fights over whether or not uh, Travis County uh, builds an $80 million new women's jail. Um, I'm also a new dad, um, and you might hear Felix in a few minutes waking up um, from his nap. Um, and I think that one of the things that uh, Felix arriving has has sort of uh, brought about for me is thinking a lot more about what Travis County's future looks like. Um, and I think that for a lot of us, right, for working class people and middle class people, uh, there's a lot of concern about whether we or our kids um, are going to be able to, are going to have any place in our community, right? Um, uh, it feels sometimes like the people in power have planned for a city that is, you know, a playground for the for the rich, right? Uh, where the rest of us um, uh, don't have a role. Um, and I think perhaps, you know, uh, most galling was the Travis County Commissioner's Court's vote to give $14 million in tax breaks to the richest man in the world to move his company here at the height of the pandemic uh, and during uh, a time when so many of our fellow Travis County residents were out of work. And um, uh, so this is in June of 2020, right? Um, uh, and, you know, at the same time, uh, moving forward with this plan to build two thirds of a billion dollars in new jails, uh, the women's jail being the first uh, uh, stage in that plan, right? And I think that um, we can do something better with Travis County, right? We can do something that works to build a Travis County that works for working people, that works for middle-class people, that works for communities of color. We can choose to not make, uh, to not double down on the racist and broken criminal justice system that we have in Travis County, but we can choose to invest in the things that we know keep people out of jail in the first place. 
right? Things like housing as a public safety uh, strategy, right? And it, and the county should have a housing policy and it currently does not. Um, things like good union jobs, right? Not tax breaks for tech billionaires. Things like uh, 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 substance use and mental health treatment facilities that are outside of the criminal justice system. Um, uh, you know, it was very galling during the during the Travis during the women's jail debate. You know that there were commissioners saying that uh, the only place that poor people can get services is in the jail. So we need to build this new jail with services, right? Without sort of ever broaching the idea that let's build these facilities for you know poor and working class people outside of the criminal justice system, because we know that when a wealthy person in White Austin has a substance use. Uh, issue, they're not getting those services after being arrested, after potentially losing their place of employment, their apartment, perhaps even their children, right? Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, and I think the other thing I want to say about Travis County is, I think that as a movement, right, um, the criminal justice reform movement, the economic justice movement, um, we've made a lot of inroads at the city of Austin, right? Uh, people tend to know what is going on. We have won, we have led and won, you know, seminal campaigns from paid sick leave to the Freedom City policy. Um, but at Travis County, there seems to be almost by design very little in the way of structured input. Um, uh, it's often very difficult to even know what the major things that are happening at Travis County are. Uh, 700 Lavaca, where Travis County Commissioner's Court uh, uh, takes place, is often feels like a ghost town. Uh, and I want to change that, right? Both through our campaign and then when elected by inviting the movement and inviting the community to see 700 Lavaca as its building, right? And seeing it as a place where um, uh, a place where uh, uh, ideas become policy, right? And where people feel welcome and not excluded because uh, they're formally incarcerated or they're immigrants or they're working class folks, right? Um, some of that, some of that, we're trying to model on the campaign. Um, we're the first campaign to have our website in Spanish and Travis, for running for Travis County Commissioner's Court. Uh, I'm really proud that uh, we're the first campaign to, uh, for Travis County Commissioner's Court in Precinct 2 history, I think, to sign a labor peace agreement with our campaign staff. Um, and I would be really honored uh, to have uh, Austin DSA's uh, endorsement. And I'm sure I've left out some things that I was supposed to talk about here, but um, Maybe I'll leave it at that and just uh, see if anybody has any questions for me. Um, and I'm very excited about uh, continuing the conversation. Thanks, Bob. I should note that we do expect candidates to uh, speak and then okay, great. get folks speaking on your behalf during the <laughs> debate. Um, so yeah, if you have a question, please type stack in the chat and we'll go to questions. So uh, first up is Quinn. Hi, uh, Quinn, uh, he, him. Uh, just in 2018, uh, when the Democrats took over Harris County, Leonard Hidalgo obviously had a very celebrated campaign for, for that kind of surprising upset. How do you think that's kind of a parallel situation to what they did in 2018 in Harris County? And, and how would you uh, compare what you would do if you were elected to, to what's happened in Harris County for the last four years? Yeah, I mean, I think... Um... You know, the, the work that I know best is the criminal justice reform work, right, in Harris County, which I think um, if you talk to advocates who are deep in that work, there still is a lot of work to do in Harris County. Uh, Grassroots Leadership has a, a, an office, a Texas Advocates for Justice uh, office in, in Harris County, um, and there's a lot of work. They, they've, done, they've, they've been successful in certain policy victories, right, including beating back um, the consistent asks for more and more prosecutors, right? Um, uh, I think that we're, I actually think that the moment that we're in in Travis County is one where you have people who have been elected since uh, the summer of 2020 um, and people who were elected before. Uh, and the people who were elected since the summer of 2020 seem interested in working with community organizations, particularly on uh, criminal justice reform issues, right? I think uh, Judge Brown's office has, you know, 
uh, reaches out to criminal justice reform organizations, you know, penned a very eloquent op-ed with Annette Price, the co-director of grassroots leadership against the women's jail and why these other investments were so necessary. Um, uh, and I kind of think it goes back to a little bit of what uh, Leah was talking about earlier, right, at the, at, the, at the top of the program, right, we really have this, you know, do we just elect a Democrat, right, or do we elect, you know, someone who wants to fight for transformative change that brings in more people, right, that, that you know, sort of brings in a movement perspective to the office. Um, so I think that that's maybe where I see things, that this is kind of, um, you know, maybe a like, uh, uh, what's the documentary with like AOC bringing down the house, right? It's maybe like that kind of moment, right? Like this is a, a, a real movement versus establishment kind of dynamic. Okay, thanks, Bob. And I'm gonna close stack for questions now. Um, Andy, you are up with the last question. Hi. Um... So this might be a little bit niche of a question, but something that um, really stuck out to me was you were pointing out how there seems to be a disconnect between the community and like policymaking um, because it's incredibly difficult to stay plugged in. Um, and you're very right about that. Uh, I would just like to hear a little, because I just kind of looked up real quick what the commissioner, commissioner of course does, yeah. and that's not necessarily what the commissioner's court does. So I would be very interested to hear like how you plan to like inform the public and to stay connected with the public, because that is a really big bridge that needs to be built. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that question. I actually think that's like the big, in some ways, the biggest question, right? The most, because there's no way for criminal justice reform or immigrant rights or economic justice organizations to um, yeah, be involved if, you, if we don't know what's going on, right? Um, and I think that, I don't know if it's by design, but it certainly seems to benefit the status quo that uh, nobody tends to know what is going on at Travis County. And some of that is structural. There aren't reporters for the Chronicle or the uh, statesmen who cover it as a beat, right? So it's, uh, but I also think that the commissioners do a very, very poor job of uh, telling people what's happening, right? My council member, I agree with her on some things, I disagree with her on some things, but I get a monthly newsletter from my city council member saying like, these are the things that have happened and these are the upcoming votes, right? None of that exists from the commissioner's court. Um, the, if you go on the incumbent's website, I think the latest newsletters from 2015, right? Um, the, uh, the, uh, the, there's an email like once or twice a year, maybe, right? Um, we've struggled as criminal justice reform advocates to even know when major budget items are coming up um, because it's just not publicized. So I think there's just some really basic like community outreach and communication stuff, but then, but then beyond that, right? I want to invite the brain trust that we have in our community on these issues, right? On housing, on criminal justice reform, on immigration policy into the space, right? To be a part of the decision-making. And I think that if you talk to particularly directly impacted folks who have tried to engage, they don't feel like that uh, is a, in any way a welcoming space today. And I wanna make it that. All right, we are now gonna to switch to the debate section. If you would like to speak for or against, please type stack for or stack against in the chat. It's a minute. So we are moving on to the last item of business for the meeting today. Um, but we're voting on an endorsement for Greg Kassar for Congress. So I think first up we have a speech by Greg Kassar. Hey y'all, it's good to be with everybody again. Um, I uh, know many, if not most of the folks on this call. So it's just really uh, great to see y'all. And we know a lot of the work that we've done together. Um, but I just want to really thank the group for the time because this will be my last time talking to y'all probably as a council member, win or lose in this race. And so much of what I remember um, and ha has made this job so worth it um, has been the work that I've gotten to do with y'all, um, really stunning people, um, how it is that we can change the priorities at City Hall. 
uh, and who City Hall works for and what the point of the building is and frankly what it always should have been. Uh, but a lot of times what uh, DSA has been able to do here is work in just awesome coalition with uh, lots of community groups and then directly with me and my staff as we strategize together. And that's something that you just don't see in lots of places. And so I'm just so grateful and thankful for that. That's why, you know, when 50% of the affordable housing elections in the city until 2018 had gone down and the trend of city government was to try to make those affordable housing elections smaller and smaller because they were scared that it would go down. And instead, what we did was we made it the biggest ever um, and came for $250 million and then another 300 million two years later as part of the transit election. And we showed people that by actually putting forward meaningful proposals that could actually change thousands of people's lives, we won bigger than ever. Um, and that has changed the trajectory of housing politics. Um, I think for years, whether I'm on the dais, uh, things like the paid sick time uh, coalition that we built sent ripples, not just through Austin, but passed the exact same policy that we coordinated and worked on together in Dallas and in San Antonio and reshaped the conversation at the legislature. And even though it's so awful that in the middle of the pandemic, the Texas Supreme Court blocked that law using their made up logic. Um, at the end of the day, it moves forward it, and, and help build a stronger worker justice movement in this city that I know is what is going to propel us to win not just paid sick time, but paid parental leave um, and the PRO Act and all of the things we need for not just every person in our city, but every person in our state and our country. And it's that um, work that we've done that inspires me to believe that running for Congress is the right, absolutely the right thing to do at this moment. Uh, and we've been through big wins and big losses together, you know, passing the decriminalization of homelessness, but then fighting back really hard um, every single day against uh, Matt Makoviak's Prop B. And then even after that electoral loss, realizing that that doesn't have to be a complete loss because the organizing couldn't be stopped and translating that into creating hundreds and hundreds of new homes for people to come off of the streets. Uh, in my first two years on city council, we approved 35 permanent supportive housing units in the city in two years. In the last two years, we have approved over 800. Over 800. That's more than 20 times more than we did our first two years. And there are hundreds, if not thousands more coming. And that's, again, because of the really incredible organizing work, not just advocacy work, not just policy writing work, but the real organizing work that we've been able to do together here. Um, and we don't even have to talk uh, about uh, Prop A and that and that just amazing win. Um, but I think we should um, uh, because we should feel really good about that because the incredible work that was done out of so much pain and hurt after the killing of George Floyd uh, and Mike Ramos and so many others made us a place where we actually questioned the police budget and we actually moved money out of it in a way that almost no other city in this country was able to. And even after they made it their top priority at the legislature to stop what we were doing, even after they spent millions of dollars lying about what it was we were doing here in Austin, they couldn't take it away. We just bought a hotel to set up a family violence shelter that we could not have done without that organizing work and without that transformational budget. If you dial 911 right now, you get mental health as an option. Do you need fire, police, EMS, or mental health? You have that option, and that never would have happened if it weren't for that organizing work. So out of so much pain and out of such uh, a just stuck political culture of you know, hollow liberal branding without real solutions for working people, out of lots of political losses or times we were told that this was just never going to work, we've been able to do some really, really amazing work. And so regardless of what happens in my race, um, I'm just so thankful to have been able to have spent some time um, in this city and on this earth working alongside people on this call. Um, and I know we're going to, you know, keep on doing the, the work, um, you know, and, and the doors we've knocked on for Heidi and for Bernie and for Jose and all of that together, I just know is going to create more and more good work. Um, and that's part of the a big part of the reason for running for Congress, because we know we will create really good work just out of running but I also know that we can and we should win this race. And that if I'm able to continue to have that model of co-governance and co-organizing alongside our community, 
um, that there's even more we can do with this bigger platform. Uh, but I need folks help um, because even though our polling shows us way ahead, that means the bad guys have that same polling themselves and we know exactly what they're gonna do. They're gonna push a button that spends millions of dollars and they won't even notice that they're missing the millions of dollars to smear me with every smear that you have seen and you can already predict. We've actually already seen the polling they've started to run and it's everything you would expect. I mean, they already have the AOC ads or whatever, so they just flip my face in or whatever <laughs> um, and say it and say Texas. Um, and so it's coming. And the fact of the matter is the majority of people in this district um, you know, don't necessarily know who I am or just know a little bit about me. And the only way that they win is if they lie with enough money um, quick enough that, that it drags us down. But I know that at the doors and having real conversations with people, um, people can smell bullshit. Um, and and y'all being able to talk to people and telling them the real story of where we're coming from and what it is we're trying to do um, will, I think, turn this election. That way, every time they see a scary ad, in the actual side, so I just really appreciate the chance to be here with y'all, um, and, uh, and it's good to see you. Thanks, Greg. We will now move to the questions section. So if you have a question for Greg Azar, please type stack in the chat. And I am going to prioritize folks who have not asked a question yet. And I'm going to give you 30 seconds. And please make sure it's a question and not a speech. <laughs> um, so first up, Anna, a question. Thanks. Uh, my name is Anna. She, her pronouns. Uh, basically, you know, Leah talked about in the chair's report that Austin DSA does not do paper endorsements and a big part of our electoral politics um, comes in the time and energy we spend building our movement. Uh, we've been close partners with uh, District 4's office and seen that we can accomplish a lot when we work together. Uh, but your response on our questionnaire uh, seemed to indicate that the only way you want to promote or represent Austin DSA is by putting us on your website. So I'm curious, uh, how do you see your campaign and if you win your office coordinating with DSA to represent and uh, build our socialist movement? Yeah, I think that we um, would be meeting regularly, planning what the moments are to elevate your campaigns and work um, or to do the work together. And, I, and for me, when, when I saw Corey Bush go and start sleeping on the steps of the Capitol when the eviction moratorium was going to lapse and then saw so many other few members start coming out, but then sort of a broad national community push around that, that created the necessary pressure or cover or likely components of both for Biden to have to extend that eviction moratorium. To me, the first thing that came to my mind is like, God, what if everybody did that? Or what if just a few more people did that? I mean, he didn't have... She didn't have to negotiate with Joe Manchin or with Kristen Cinema or with anybody, right? It just changed policy and saved thousands of people from losing their homes. And I think that there's going to be so many more opportunities like that where we can coordinate directly with Austin DSA, with DSA chapters, with the labor movement, with the coalitions that we've built to grow those coalitions. Whether it is a campaign led by movement leaders that I can use our letterhead or our powers in Congress to amplify or whether it's something that you all think I should be leading on and then y'all build the organizing work around it, I would just expect that we use the exact same relationship that we have built um, to be able to have that kind of, of deciding who plays what role and what the strategic moments are. But that was just an amazing strategic moment that just showed how one, I mean, everybody that I've talked to has said like, really, she helped drive that, but then did it in a strategic way in the right moment with the right community support to change the lives of thousands of people. Um, and that's my hope of and, and sense of what freshman members of Congress can do. Thanks. Next up, we have Rui. Yeah, okay. So I wanted to ask a question that is pretty relevant to our current uh, recent events. Uh, and it was about your response on the endorsement questionnaire about uh, Israel and Palestine. And you said you, you support a lot of the same views that Senator Bernie Sanders does. 
Could you elucidate a little bit more, just talk a bit about what that means um, and more concretely what you would uh, like to see to you know, end the um, apartheid or the occupation going on in occupied Palestine? Thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so you know, my main time that we've had to engage on some of these questions has been around the Texas law that uh, had a Pflugerville speech therapist uh, lose her job because of her political beliefs on what is happening to Palestinian people. And I think that that's, that that's wrong. And that seems you know, very clear to me. Now, as I run for Congress and would have uh, these you know, major foreign policy decisions before me, I really am trying to spend my time meeting with people, talking with folks, and fully understanding what the best role for me to play is. But baseline, uh, pretty easy for me to, to say that I believe that the occupation uh, needs to end as soon as possible and, of course, should have ended a long time ago. And I you know, stand in solidarity with those people who've had their rights trampled upon and want to see liberation of, of all folks there and for people to have self-determination and autonomy. Uh, there's definitely um, you know, some clear places where I know that you know, USAID should not go um, to doing things that are illegal or wrong and, and very clearly stand on that side of things. And so I've seen uh, and have heard how Senator Sanders has tackled a lot of these issues, especially as a Jewish American um, elected official himself. And so that resonates with me and see feels pretty clear. But I know that, there, that it, there are a lot more questions and a lot more pieces to this. And so I just have sort of humbly submitted that I still really need to meet with folks and continue to work on like exactly which bills to sign on to, exactly which role I play within all of this, but absolutely the end to the occupation, uh, the end to any of our actions as the United States extending that um, seems very, very clear to me because if we care about the health and safety of people, um, be they Palestinian or Israeli, uh, the end to the occupation should benefit all of those folks. And then the humanitarian crisis in Gaza is also something that the center has spoken quite a bit about um, and resuming aid to make sure that people, I mean, what can you expect? And if, if you make it, if you create a situation where the majority of folks are unemployed and people don't have clean water or infrastructure, um, that doesn't make things better for anyone. And of course, the worst for Palestinian folks in Gaza. And so those are, those are place, those are ideas and values that even though I've only been running for Congress for not even a month and a half, um, I think just very much align with my core values around human rights. All right, Joshua. Thanks for being here, Greg. Uh, and I appreciate the work you've done on city council. On the Austin city council, you certainly had fellow council members who came in hostile to be polite to DSA's agenda, but, but not all of them were hostile to everything that, that, that we're pushing. In the Texas legislature, you're going into a body that is a substantial majority Republican. I think it's safe to assume all of whom oppose everything on our agenda. And most of your Democratic colleagues will also oppose, or many of them will also oppose. What, how do you see your ability to affect policy, public policy in that body given you're coming into a very different body than the, than the uh, Austin City Council, where at least our ideas had some traction going in. Yeah, and so um, as folks have mentioned here, um, the, the seat is in the United States Congress, which where we happen to have a majority at this moment, but that majority is not at all guaranteed, a majority of Democrats, not certainly not a majority of progressives. Um, and so to take your, your question um, pretty directly, I think it's really important for us to continue the organizing work um, to across the state of Texas. So part of what I intend to do if I win is to not just campaign for the primary and then go away, but do the real work to really increase voter turnout in my district and in surrounding areas so that we can impact governor's races and US Senate races. Um, and to impact which folks get elected to the congressional seats and to get involved in city council races or school board races. So that if you have 
um, a school board race where there's a DSA endorsed labor candidate um, that I should be involved in use and use that because part of what I found, because at the same time, I think your intro to this question is totally true. And so um, uh, is that at the end of the day, where we have our strength is through our ability to show that we're going to outwork people and outorganize people and push harder. Um, and, that, and that's where we got a lot of votes from people who, you know, the folks that were there at the sick days vote, there were some people that were making a face like, I can't believe I have to vote for this, but here goes my hand going up. Uh, that's, a, that's fine. That vote counts just as well. And so um, that's my hope is to continue to help uh, drive that um, and, and to be somebody that is helping build organization and build more voters um, uh, alongside a progressive agenda because there's a progressive minority in Congress, but the vast majority of people in Texas believe in Medicare for all and the PRO Act and reproductive rights and the lights turning on rather than you know just extra money going to fossil fuel companies. All those things we know the majority of voters believe. So I hope to use the, the office um, to, to help us organize those voters to get the results that it is that we want, um, as opposed to, as you've said, just walking in and raising my hand at the right time, but letting the rest of the votes fall where they may, because that, that strategy doesn't work. All right, we have a motion to extend questions. Um, I may also need a motion to extend debate soon, um, but first we'll vote on the motion to extend questions. So if folks can type I or nay in the chat. It looks like the eyes clearly have it. Uh, so I'm going to go to the single last question we had. And then if someone wants to motion to extend debate, that would be welcomed. Um, last question we have is Ashley. Hi, thanks, Phil. Um, this question is concerning some, maybe they're rumors, but things that I've heard third hand kind of about the staffing on Greg's campaign as it is right now. Um, I think there's some concern about uh, union members and, uh, oh gosh, sorry, I was not that prepared. Um, I guess I would just like to hear what your plans are for involving DSA and DSA members in your campaign um, if we do endorse, or I guess if we don't, but uh, yeah. That's that's the gist of it. Sure. No, I um, so virtually all of my uh, office staff, uh, along with me, are DSA members. Uh, I don't know, have the direct count on my uh, campaign staff, but we're still staffing up. I mean, where I think we're at maybe one fourth or a third of the staffing that I think we're going to get to, uh, because you have to spend a lot of time, unfortunately, you know, doing all the money raising at the front end so that you have a budget and can promise people a job uh, and follow through on it. Um, I think our starting wage for, for Canvas staff is at like 22 an hour, and I would want to keep pushing that up as we raise more money. Um, I recently signed a labor peace agreement, um, uh, and we'll sign a labor peace agreement with any union that wants to organize anywhere that I uh, employ folks. Uh, I think 100% of my staff at the city um, are AFSCME members, um, and so Again, uh, under federal labor law, I don't interfere with or tell folks whether to join a union or not. I just entirely allow unions to, to talk with those workers and, and have them make those decisions the best that they can. Uh, I think, you know, as long as I've run campaigns, usually have tried to pay more than everybody else and um, pretty used to having union staff. All right, that is the end of questions. Thank you for staying longer, Greg. And uh, but thank you for the question. I, I, I know that sometimes folks think that that might be a touchy question or something, but it's not to me. So thank you for asking. Uh, thanks, Greg. And um, as we mentioned, we usually ask members or um, candidates to leave for the debate. So thanks. Sounds for good. Off. I appreciate you all. Bye. 
Uh, okay, we have a motion to extend debate since we're out of time right now. That has been seconded. So if folks can type I or nay in the chat. We're going to close debate now. And um, I will share the link to vote. And reminder, you have until midnight and votes will be shared with the membership. Um, thank you, comrades, for keeping it comradely. This was a good, it's good, good to have debate. It's good to discuss this stuff. And I really appreciate y'all for keeping it comradely. Um, and yeah, you have, like, reminder, you have until midnight to vote tonight, so. Without further ado, that's the end of the meeting. Thanks, y'all.